Okay. So hi everyone, I'll just share my screen. Okay, thank you for coming everyone. What I wanted to talk to you about today is kind of the world of Google Analytics. Essentially, it's called the life cycle of an ad, but I don't know about you, but I was always wondering whenever you go on an advert, why is it that advert there, not any other ones, and how did they get here? So it's kind of crazy if you think about it, looking at the statistics um, from an advertiser's ad, it can reach 400 million consumers and 70 countries in less than 10 seconds. And this is all due to real time bidding and auctions and how adverts get here. To kind of put it into perspective, this is the Loomiscape, which shows all of the, which shows all of the different um, advertising technology players we have. And if you look at just 2014, there was only 947, and by 2019, we already have over 7,000 different providers. To kind of get to know what they are, um, I just wanted to quickly show you who are the key players that make up all of this ecosystem. So we have the advertisers here on the left. So anyone who has an ad, Nike, Amazon, and wants to show it, and they go to agencies to create this advertisement and kind of who we want to target, what's the budget, all these details. And then we have publishers on the right, and that's anyone who has any web content and are looking to make some money from advertising. So essentially like, um, in the ancient times, 10 years ago in the tech world, we have the demand side platform and we have the supply side platform. And they kind of store all the information from multiple agencies. And we have the supply side platform that store all this information from publishers. And all these companies kind of 10 years ago, you would kind of have to sign contracts and they would connect together and to gain multiple different supplies and demand from each side. However, the reason Google kind of shares 60% of the market is because they created this thing called the ad exchange. So it multiple, um, connects simultaneously all the demand side platforms and the supply side companies. So nowadays we have real time bidding, you don't have to sign contracts and all the information flows in less than 10 seconds. To illustrate how this happens, I created a little diagram. Hopefully if you have any questions, do ask, or is we're doing it at the end, however you want to do it, but hopefully it makes sense. So first we start with this little dude who's on his computer and he's about to go on a website. So what we have is this number one step is called the ad call and validation. So this person's about to click on the link and when you click on the link, a website loads up. So we have this thing called the web server and this loads the website. So essentially if your internet cut out, the website would never load. So this ensures that this happens. And then we have the content delivery network. So if you click, for example, on the blog site, all the text and images and everything that happens on the website is loaded through this server. And then we have an ad slot. So essentially, this ad slot is called to the publisher ad server. All the publishers are all the um, advertisers that are out there. And he's like, we need an ad for this website. Can you provide one? So it has an ad call to Google, which has an impression bus. And this is their servers. I don't know why it's called an impression bus, but essentially it's all about facilitating data, kind of just like a bus um, transports passenger from location A to B. So we have the cache where everything, all this is stored. And this kind of passes all this information. So the cookie, the IP address, the referrer, user agent, and browser language tries to know who the user is and where it's coming from. And once it reaches here, it basically confirms the response. If it has a bounce call, domain detection, you, where you're coming from, is it a bot? Is it a real person? Is it the dark web? Is it incognito mode? And then we have the validation. Is your IP blacklisted um, or banned? Are you eligible for real-time bidding? all that lovely stuff. And then once we have all about the information, we want to know more about the person. So this is all done through the cookie. So we have step two, which is data enrichment. We have two databases called the Cookie Monster and Aerospike. Again, I don't know the names, but it's all great. And then we have where this all of this stores the behavioral enrichment and contextual enrichment data. So behavioral enrichment, which is an Aerospike, uses user frequency, recency, and segment data. So 
how many times has the user been on this website and when was the last time or is it the first time? And then the segment data is what's all this person looking for? Which website are they at? So if they're cooking, they want to have essentially something related to cooking in terms of advertising or any family friendly website. You wouldn't want to have anything else on this website. Whereas contextual enrichment is all about kind of the laptop you're using and everything else known about your device. So Digital Envoy uses IP address, kind of providing the country, region, city, and even as close as your postcode data. So sometimes adverts are for specific um, locations, for example, tourism, certain concerts, um, what time of the day, all this, the advert needs to know to kind of, kind of have that targeted experience. And then we have the device atlas, which uses the user agent string, so part of the URL code, to provide the browser, operating system, and device type information. So obviously, ad sizes are sometimes smaller for mobiles and bigger for tablets and laptops or TVs. So once basically the publisher knows all about the person and what kind of advertising happens, we go to step three, which is real-time data providers. And to kind of segregate all this, we need to know all about IDs and things like that. So all this information goes to the real-time data service and it basically jumbles up and combines everything we need to know. So like seller member IDs, auction IDs, geos, external user ID, all this lovely stuff, which goes to the RTP, RTDP servers. And this goes to a cloud, which is offline and stores any information just in case anything happens. And this comes back with a segment ID to process the information, which is then going back to generate a bid request. So once we have all this information about the ad slot, we need to choose the correct advertiser. So then we have step four, which is bid requests and responses. So this essentially chooses and connects with the, as we knew at the top here, it connects with the supply side platform. And then now we go into the demand side platform. So it uses all the relevant profiles and bidders, aka also known as advertisers, and all the preferable, relevant, and required profile requirements. And this is all to do with the bid number, who you're targeting, and bid value. And this is where bidders will send back multiple bids for the advertisers who are most likely to win the auction. So now we go to the auction logic. Now, let me know if that doesn't make sense. I'll try my best to explain this. But basically, um, there are thousands and thousands of bidders at one time in less than, like, I think, five or 10 milliseconds that bid um, in order for this person to have an advert when they click on the link. To simplify this, I only use three, which is ASOS, $4, Amazon, $7, and Nike, $2. And they all bid. Now, it'd be really easy to say if people with the highest bids obviously win. But that means that a lot of people could do £100 and it would go up every single time in order to win this. And is £100 for one advert for one person really worth it? The business model would kind of break. But at the same time, could be um, a lot of people could be like, well, I'm just going to pay one penny. And if a lot of people wait, pay one penny to win, they would pay 1.1 or 1.2 and so on to win. And it wouldn't generate a much money. And again, if a lot of people generate the same amount, they automatically um, are kind of, if the two highest, for example, are $7, they choose the next two. And if one kind of bids one penny, again, the business model will break. So Google likes to kind of create essentially different rules to make sure that there's no really a strategy to win this, to make it fair that everyone has a fair chance at having the advert kind of viewed by the viewer on this website. So what they have first is called the hard floor, which is a re reserve price that all the net bids under this are not eligible for an auction. So they take the two um, highest bidders, which is the $7 and the $4. And they take it away from each other, which is the $3, which is the hard floor. So anyone under $3 is not eligible for this auction anymore. So Nike goes out of the game. So then we go back to the top $2 uh, bidder, sorry. And then obviously Amazon has $7 and is crowned the winner. Now all the other players are still in here. And they're set there for a specific reason, which I'll go back to in a minute. But Amazon wins and their adverts gets put through. However, they don't get to pay $7 because like I mentioned, a lot of people would kind of want to pay one penny or more. This is to encourage people to pay more and more money. So they actually take away, which is the soft law, which is the point below which no further price reduction will occur. 
So they take the minimum, a minimum bid, which was Nike, which is $2. And then they take it away from the highest, which is seven minus two, which equals $5. So even though Amazon won, they ended up paying $5 at the end. And this kind of encourages people to bid as high as possible because if they win, the reduction will be even higher. Cool, does that make sense so far? I'll check in the chat. How do you find out if your bid is under the floor price? That's the thing. Um, I'll get to that under in section six, if that's okay. Um, okay, so then we go into this cash because there's a lot of foul play, as you can imagine, could happen. So this is where basically it checks that the advertisement is okay, there's no full play, and that both conditions from the publisher and the advertiser are met. So first of all, if Google is the ad bidder here, they also have their own ads, right? Um, Google paid and all that kind of stuff. So if they're the only people controlling the technology, it could be really easy for them to win. So essentially they um, kind of promote all these rules and check it at the end to make sure that they are also playing fairly. Um, at the same time, there's different bids in these rules. So no one, no technology can essentially, it'd be really easy if another company, for example, created their own calculating software and partnered up, partner, partnered up sorry, <laughs> with everyone and kind of said, we're gonna bid $5. So the rules changed. So I think Google are kind of planning to ban software. So rules constantly change. So no one can win and it's all fair. At the same time, they check the adverts again, even though adverts are processly checked um, by other software, Google has their own software. For example, there was one advert that came through and it was about a person celebrating um, in front of like skyscrapers and it was banned and it was detected. And the reason why is because the technology kind of um, saw that there's four limbs on top of a building and it turned out that the person was jumping off the building. And obviously that's inappropriate to kind of advertise, but with a naked eye, you can see it at all. So they're very detailed um, pieces of technology. And at the same time, if that happens, the advert kind of goes out. So then all the remaining adverts that were bid, sorry, that were kind of left over, this process happens all over again. And then an advert gets chosen. So once the winning kind of advert goes through this, it's called a creative and they get their own ID and it matches with the segment ID to know what's coming. And this is passed all the way back to the generate bid request. And then this goes to step five, which is the ad response. So then the advert goes back all the way to the page when you've clicked on the link. And this happens in less than 10 seconds. And this is where it redirects to the content delivery network and delivers the ad. And it also has viewability scripts to the log data for either reporting or analysis purposes. So essentially, anyone who wants to look back what's happened, they can do through this and the person sees that ad. Um, I don't know, sometimes if you saw on websites and you click where the ad spot, it says there's been an error and it's just left blank. This is when the part four doesn't quite work and they're working on it, but it shouldn't happen. You should usually have an ad. And every time you refresh the page, you have a different app. Again, this is where step four works and generates a new ad. And all the remaining adverts are used then. And then when you have step six, which is once the person sees the ad, they go on with their life. And this is for actual people who want to know what's happening inside, if there's a bug, um, anything else that's happening. So we have two databases in a massive data warehouse called Hadoop and Vertica. So Hadoop is basically a storage and processing um, big data database. So all this information that we saw that's being collected from all of these parts get stored in this one massive database because software developers don't want to go around all these different databases and collecting it. They want to have everything in one place. However, it's all jumbled up and essentially that makes no sense. So it takes three hours to aggregate, which goes into Vertica. And this is where it has all the lovely columns and rows with the customer name, what advert, what advertiser happens, and everyone um, gets to know what's happening. However, not everyone's a software developer. So advertisers usually want to know what's going on. And to answer your question as well, how do we know what the bid price is? How do we know what's happening, who bids and who wins? So this is where we have the console UI, which is the API that pulls all the data, the application programming interface. And it allows people basically to create um, 
all this like different CRM softwares and upload all this information in segments. So all it requires is front end kind of software, which you have like a login, um, a password, you log in, and then you have all this information you can search for. How much did you bid for? Um, how much, for example, did it win? Did it not? Which customer did it end up? And this is really useful for retargeting. So that's kind of the whole process. Um, so yeah, let me know if you have any questions. I'm sure there's loads. I, I've got a question. Yeah. Or are we, are we doing it from the chat? I think someone posted a question. Go for it, guys. Okay, cool. Uh, cool. So my question on step four, what's, I didn't quite understand why they won't let just the highest bidder win. I didn't quite get that logic. Um, it's more to do with the way you kind of think about if there's unlimited bidding, um, essentially people would just go for the highest and highest. And then when you go through reporting and see someone bid 100, then you're 120 and everyone keeps bidding higher and higher to win. Um, from an advertiser point, would you bid over 100 pounds for just one advert if you have thousands of advertisements each day? Well, no, but like surely there's a point at which the market sort of balances out. Yeah, that's true in a way where everyone would just be like, going to my example, everyone would just be like, well, we're just got, all going to pay one penny. Mm -hmm. And then Google would lose out in terms of being the ad exchange. Um, I so suppose they, you with the big boys like Amazon just dominating everything. And if you're in the small business, you've got no chance. Exactly. So to make this fair, they create all these different rules. So everyone gets a chance to bid and you don't know what everyone else is going to bid um so even if amazon wants to save money they'll just do five but seven but depends on the difference um between the two highest so even if amazon wants to donate they do seven um someone else could go slower um a bit lower sorry and then it depends all about the different numbers and everyone basically has a chance or a fair auction if that makes sense that's so clever i love that yeah if i explain that very right <laughs> correct me if i'm wrong any more questions from anyone? Hey, I'll go next. Uh, firstly, that was an incredible presentation. I want to know how you, what you use to kind of put this infographic together. It's really uh, well thought out and well designed. Um, right, now that I've complimented you, I've forgotten what my question was. <laughs> this is why I always have a pen and paper. <laughs> um, shoot. We what can come back to you, don't worry. Yeah, you. <laughs> No worries. Anyone have any other questions? Um, one of the things I wanted to ask if no one else has a question is kind of looking at all the data. Um, this is just kind of real time bidding to do with websites, right? But nowadays, for example, they're getting more and more involved with like speaking assistants, um, connected TV, and all this data that they're collecting on you. How do you feel about your data privacy? And is this kind of right? And is GDPR, obviously that's way behind and there's so many ways to get past it. How do you feel? Do you feel comfortable with all this data being shared about you? Uh, from my perspective, I'm I'm fine with it. You get free stuff; they get my data. That's kind of the the, the um I don't know the trade off that we tend to take. I'm not yeah. sure what anyone else's view is. I accept it because it's sort of what it needs to be. But I do when I think about it, I feel uncomfortable, so I try not to think about it very often. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel the same way. So I was kind of digging a bit deeper into like what companies are doing for the next few months. And there's one, for example, on Spotify, and they know your location, where you're walking and when you're listening to music. And for example, if you're in the city center, they would throw an ad. Basically, if you're near a shop, they would throw the ad and be like, finish the advert and then be like, if you look on the right, the store is on the right. Um, to make sure that you walk in and so they know all that data wow. or there was another one that has access to your like um, google mail or outlook and you know when you get confirmation emails with receipts so for example you bought some cool trainers and there was an advertiser with different trainers brand kind of retargeting you they see um where you bought your other trainers for and trying to convert you to their store so is there like a bridge? Is that right? They're looking at, you know, essentially your bank statement. Do you agree with that and how it's progressing? 
Well, Lily, I think I think the thing is when they're selling off all this information to retailers and all these people that just want to know, like, there's a thing called biopsychology, you know. So they're trying to just man I wouldn't say well manipulate, but that's literally what they're doing. They want to get their profits. And for them to make smarter business decisions, just like what you were saying about where where they got their previous sneakers and all that stuff for them to be able to make better business decisions they have to have this data and that's how it helps them but i feel that if they are using the uh, data then we have to gain something from it i know some people have been saying oh we probably need to be paid for our data as well in some form or fashion but how's that's going to be done i'm not really sure uh, I think I would like to add to it. I agree with like many of you. It's fine as long as it's minimal and it's not influencing my decisions. So for example, what's happening now is actually they are subconsciously trying to manipulate us. And, you know, there's a whole documentary on it on Netflix regarding it and, you know, how kids are shown the similar videos nonstop and, you know, it's uh, online, offline, both ways it's working. So uh, I think there has to be a cap, you know, there has to be a proper law or something gdpr has to be extended or something like that uh, you know so that we are not our decisions are not being influenced yeah that makes sense i agree there's like the good benefits and then there's like the dark side of it so it's interesting to see especially like some things like you know smart um with other technologies like when they get in your home and it's all about smart uh, connected you know they control your water and heating or when they hear your voice through um alexa and things like that they're getting to know a lot of you so different opinions but mona how do you how do you, do you remember your question yet <laughs> yeah i remember my question but um but to add to this conversation, I think, so one of my friends is an app developer, right? And when this whole debacle about, um, I think Facebook buying WhatsApp happened and people were deleting it, um, she made it, she, we had a conversation about it and she was like, look, as an app developer, I need to know what works, what doesn't work in order to make the app better. So I like the fact that things are kind of made easier for us. But my concern is, especially after watching um, The Social Dilemma Network, Netflix, a lot of uh, people who work in the tech industry, they were afraid that they are controlling and manipulating our behaviours, which I guess kind of happens in the ad space, but when it comes to the wide scale of like manipulating elections, it would be really interesting for like the average layperson like me to know how that data manipulates us because to this day I still don't quite understand it and I remember one of the comments which kind of stuck with me from that documentary was that um, there are like, you know, the programmers or developers or whoever they are, they dictate how we think and what we believe. And I find that really interesting that they are the ones that essentially create this architecture and we think within the architecture. So it would be interesting to know how that's constructed. And that was it. Yeah. I think it's more to do with like the data. So if, I don't know, I think if they, it wasn't it on the social demo, if they see you like someone or you haven't, they purposely create more friends and things to kind of, make you to interact even though you don't really necessarily want to but they know how to get you to come back so it's really interesting how they use the data um and how kind of the government and everyone views it so it's really great <laughs> and um yeah to answer your other question as well Mona um I was just looking I used to work in ad tech but kind of working out marketing analytics and um, kind of working with consumers and analyzing their behavior. So I just thought, but well, where does that data come from? And on that diagram, I just worked backwards um, to find out where it's from. Any more questions from anyone? I was just gonna ask, um, with the GDPR stuff, if you don't accept the cookies on the site, can Google still track your personal preferences? I'm not sure how they do that, can't remember. Yeah, so essentially when you disable, or not. I'm just here to briefly, but essentially when you disable cookies, you there's like a super cookie in the background, which not many people know how to disable properly. But remember when I was talking about how all of this has to be tracked through a segment ID and then to reporting to know what's happening. So Google kind of argued that they need that information to track where the advert has been and why the advert was picked there. So essentially in the back end, it's still like, 
you, you're essentially an ID to them. There's no names or emails, anything involved, but they still know information about that. Um, basically, essentially, because from that laptop that you used. So say you're the same person, but used a different laptop, you'd be a completely different person to them. So there's, it's anonymous, but they still track it. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Any more questions? I did have a question, but I've got to shoot off now, I'm afraid. No worries, you can text me later if you still want to know the answer. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> that was an amazing presentation. I thought you like downloaded that diagram. Like you, um, that's insane. Um, I found some information, but it was like in paragraphs and I was like, no one's going to understand this if I just read it out loud. So, but thanks Charlie as well for encouraging me to create an infographic. <laughs> But yeah, I run it by him the first time to see if it makes sense. But thank you all so much for coming. I really appreciate thank you. it. <laughs> Thanks, Lily. Thank Bye-bye. Thanks, Lily. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Take care.